Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to. We're going to pick it up today in this beautiful book of Psalms, Psalm 18, verse 39. And uh, Psalm 18, uh, uh, looking forward to the day that we have the victory. Uh, the Lord's Day, when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And of course, just prior to the Lord's Day, though, uh, God's elect uh, have a, a mission. Uh, uh, God has a plan, and His elect will uh, uh, help accomplish His plan. Uh, part of that plan we covered in our last lecture as we ended off with the gospel armor. And I'm speaking of the references to Ephesians uh, chapter 6 where we're told about the gospel armor and that if we put it on, it allows us to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. And, you know, we don't battle against flesh. We battle against powers and principalities on high. That includes Satan himself. So you want to make sure you have that gospel armor on. So we're going to come back and finish Psalm 18 today. So without any further introduction, let's ask that Word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Psalm 18, verse 39, and it reads, For thou, referring to our Heavenly Father, hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. And part of God's elect's mission, as it's written in Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, the enemy will come to your feet. Why? Because you are going to be at the feet of Jesus Christ. So uh, the enemy will be subdued. I've read the back of the book uh, many, many times. And our Heavenly Father, there is no power in the universe greater than His power. Uh, some think that they have a good deal of power but compared to God's power, I'll assure you, it is minuscule. Verse 40. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. Uh, what this is talking about, and probably would be better translated, you have given me the backs of my enemies as they retreat. And that's when one army who was winning or being victorious at this particular time really put the hurt on the enemy army. If they could get them turned and running, in other words, retreating, then they would follow hard and catch them from behind, if you will. And that's when a lot of the losing armies lost a lot of their men. Verse 41. They cried, still talking about the enemy. They cried, but there was none to save them. Their gods, small g, could not save them. Even unto the Lord, now that's Yahweh in all caps, that's our Heavenly Father. But He answered them not. And at this point in time, speaking right now, no, I don't care what you've done or how bad you've messed up, how bad you've sinned. If you turn and, and repent, your Heavenly Father will welcome you with open arms. It's like the prodigal son. Uh, he went in and blew all of his inheritance, uh, but when the money ran out and the friends that he was able to buy, when all that ran out, he went home and his father accepted him with open arms. And it's the same with you today. I don't care what you've done, how bad you've sinned. Your Heavenly Father, as it's written in the New Testament, even the angels in heaven rejoice when one of God's children returns to Him. But there comes a, a time, beloved, and we're talk, reading about it here, this is prophecy 
of the Lord's day. There comes a time when it will be too late. If you cry out to the Lord, but you've been in spiritually in bed with Satan, the Antichrist himself, do you think the Lord's going to hear you? Of course not. It's going to be like the ten virgins of Matthew chapter 25. You remember half of them had enough oil in their lamp and they were invited in to the bridegroom, that's to say Jesus Christ. Uh, and they said, quick, give us some of your oil so that we'll have enough oil for our lamps. And they said, no, you, you go into town and buy. Of course, the oil symbolic of God's truth and always symbolic of the Holy Spirit as well. But they didn't have enough oil. And what happened when they came back and knocked on the door of the wedding feast? Uh, Jesus, the bridegroom, said, depart from me, I know you not. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's also written in the New Testament that many will come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, we, we taught in the streets in your name. We healed in your name. And he says, he's going to say, get out of my sight. I never knew you. There comes a point when it's too late. 42. Then did I beat them small, the enemies again, as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. This word cast, uh, the etymology of the word means to pour. And anytime you pour something out in the street at the time of this writing, it was done in a very contemptuous manner. Uh, the street is where the dung from the animals would be, so you get my drift. And this beat can also be translated that he crushed. And I couldn't help but think about it. A lot of this refers to David, the first man David, who this psalm is written by, but it also refers to the second man David. Uh, I speak of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it's written in Matthew 21, verse 44. Uh, he's called there the cornerstone. Jesus is re referred to as the cornerstone. And it states there in Matthew chapter 21, verse 44, that whosoever falls upon that cornerstone, meaning Christ, will be broken. And whoever he, the cornerstone, Jesus falls upon, will be crushed uh, into powder. Uh, he wins. 43. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, referring David to Saul and Absalom, no doubt. And thou hast made me the head of the heathen, or nations. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. Now, we specifically turn to Messiah as well as David because when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords on the Lord's day when the second advent begins, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Make no mistake about it, it will happen. I couldn't help but think about the head of the nations in, in Isaiah 52 verse 15 talking about the same period of time it states there in, in Isaiah prophetically that the kings of the nations, uh, the Gentiles in other words, uh, will shut their mouths and they will see things that they never knew. They will hear things that they've never heard. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Verse 44, As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers, or foreigners, shall submit themselves unto me. The second advent, again, uh, no question about who's in charge. There's going to be many, there's going to be a one world system established. Uh, it will receive the deadly wound, but pretty boy Floyd, the Antichrist, will return and heal that deadly wound. But when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns, there will be only one nation, one king of kings, one lord of lords. Verse 45, the strangers shall fade away. In other words, they, they become faint-hearted and be afraid out of their close places. Close places, 
uh, could be translated their strongholds. So uh, when Christ returns, uh, even those who are in their fortified strongholds are going to come trembling before Christ. In other words, uh, giving up the fight. Those who of, of them who are crazy enough to want to fight are sure going to get it at, at Armageddon and Hamancog. And, you, and I said earlier, God's elect, there, there, there are things that you need to be prepared to do. But when that happens, when you see Jesus' feet hit the Mount of Olives, as it's written in Zechariah chapter 14, it's time for you to stand back because he is perfectly capable of handling our enemies and he will do so. Uh, again, and in David's time, this means that they uh, came and submitted to David uh, without a fight. In other words, they surrendered. 46. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And we bless and, and exalt our Heavenly Father right now. Uh, we know what our Heavenly Father is capable of doing. We know about His power and that there is no power in the universe greater than His. So uh, we exalt Him even as we study the Scripture. When blessed be my rock, uh, you are, that are familiar with the song of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32, you know that there are two rocks I hope you know that there are two rocks. The first rock to come is Antichrist. Many are going to be deceived, as it's written in Revelation chapter 13. The whole world is going to come worship him, except those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Of course, our rock, Jesus Christ, returns after the false rock. And if you're able to keep up the difference between the sixth trump and the seventh trump, you know that the Antichrist comes first. You won't be deceived. 47, it is God that avengeth me, or gives a avengement for me, and subdueth the people under me. And his elect, we studied in a couple of lessons back, that his anointed, as he refers to his elect, or as the apple of his eye. That's also in, in Deuteronomy, the Song of Moses that we just mentioned. And the apple of your eye is the pupil of your eye. And when one of God's elect is harmed by the enemy, it's like they took their finger and stuck it in God's eye. He's not going to be happy with those who uh, uh, bring harm to his elect. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19 in the New Testament, the teaching there, Vengeance uh, belongeth to me, saith the Lord. Verse 48, He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. In other words, he lifts me up in victory. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. In the Hebrew, this is the man of violence, and his name is Antichrist. But don't be deceived. Uh, he, he's not wearing red long handle underwear with a pitchfork. He's not uh, the devil as you have him pictured in your mind. He's going to do the best he can. He's going to come in peacefully and prosperously, as it's written in the book of Daniel. And he's going to look like you think Jesus Christ should look like. That's why he will deceive so many. But the man of violence, uh, don't think of him as someone who's going to be trying to uh, kill God's elect. Uh, he can't get away with that. You see, he's playing Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can't line people up and, and kill them execution style. Neither can the Antichrist. There are two who will die. Uh, you read about those in Revelation chapter 11. They're called the two witnesses. I know many of you are familiar with them. 49. Therefore will I give or confess thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, again nations better translated, 
and sing praises unto thy name. And Paul quotes this verse as he quoted many uh, scriptures from Psalms in Romans chapter 15, verse 9. In the following verses there where uh, salvation was opened up to all, including the Gentiles, not just Israel any longer after the price was paid on the cross. Paul uh, commissioned by our Heavenly Father to bring the gospel uh, to uh, the Gentiles. 50. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. His anointed uh, in the Greek language is Christos, from which comes our English word Christ, and it can literally be translated the anointed one. David, uh, that promise made to his seed forevermore in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verse 13 and the following verses. Uh, David was sitting in his palace, his house of cedars, as it's translated in the King James Version Bible. And he looked out and he saw the Ark of the Covenant where God resides in a tent. And he thought, you know, I'm gonna build a house for the Lord. And the Lord sent a prophet to David and said, since when did I ask you to build me a house? I'm gonna build you a house, referring to his family, and there will never lack a man of your loins, of your seed, to sit on the throne. That promise uh, consummated in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when he takes his rightful place uh, on that throne as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that promise comes to pass. What a fantastic promise. I'll remind you once again, Psalm 18, except for the very first verse, is word for word matching verbatim of 2 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, we have a subscription. Those of you with companion Bibles, it'll be at the end of Psalm 18 to the chief musician, which has been rendered to uh, he who has the victory and to he, to he who gives the victory, of course, referring to uh, Jesus Christ. Psalm 19, the title, A Psalm of David. Now, let's do a little uh, preparation for this particular psalm because I think it's important. Uh, we're going to be talking about astronomy. And I want to differentiate the difference between astronomy and astrology because we're going to be talking about the zodiac and people sometimes when they get a hold of the zodiac they start thinking about the little section in their newspaper that gives forecast on what your fortune is going to be for today uh, based on some nonsense that's astrology we're not talking about astrology we are talking about astronomy in this particular psalm now many scholars believe that this psalm 19 actually when it was written was two psalms that somehow got joined together because the subject matter is so different. But if you have a companion Bible, make a note to read Bullinger's notes about how the two uh, particular subjects are interlaced together. Uh, by that I'm saying that uh, in Psalm 19 verses 1 through 6, we're going to be talking about astronomy. And then from uh, Psalm uh, 19, 7 through 14, we're going to be talking about the Word of God. But if you'll study, and I'm talking the original languages in the Hebrew, the verbs in the first six verses are literary, meaning they would, you would normally tie them to something like God's Word, which is covered in verses 7 through 14. But then in verses 7 through 14, the verbs are astro astronomical. Uh, in other words, they would normally be used in reference to uh, an astronomical subject. So uh, you see God's work uh, interlacing these two together. And, and not only is it a fit, it's a perfect fit. So uh, a revelation, if you will, of God 
uh, his son and the law in nature. So with that introduction, uh, let's go with Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. This word declare, check it out in the Hebrew, is uh, rehearse. Uh, in other words, it implies repetition. Uh, we see the universe as God placed planets in their position, stars in their position, and if you're a subscriber to the Big Bang Theory that all of that just happened somehow, uh, I feel sorry for you because uh, I like stepping out on a dark night and, and looking up at the heavens above and knowing uh, without a doubt that my Heavenly Father exists. Not only does He exist, but He placed each one of those entities in their particular orbit and and the repetition uh, of, of the whole universe comes together and you can see your Heavenly Father in it. The firmament, of course, referring to the expanse in heaven that was there in, when God created the earth, Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, that expanse or firmament will be placed back into place when our Heavenly Father rejuvenates the earth uh, when he returns his throne here and the eternity will be right here on earth. Revelation chapter 21 will document that. Verse 2, day unto day or day after day uttereth speech. And we're talking about the heavens here. Don't, don't, don't get lost. And night unto night or night after night showeth knowledge. Now the heavens of course don't actually speak to us. But if you're paying attention, they speak to us. In fact, God created them to speak to us. Why did he put all these lights in the heavens? It's written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, for signs and seasons and uh, for days and years. So, no, they don't literally speak to us, but they communicate a lot to us when you think about it. Verse 3, there is no speech nor language. And this word where, I'm going to omit it because it's in italics. It's not in the original manuscripts. Their voice is not heard. Again, they don't speak a language, but they communicate with us if we're paying attention. And we're going to see a parallel here drawn between the heavens and the word uh, about to be made, the word of God, of course. Verse 4, their line, this refers to the heavens again, uh, line you could think of as an inheritance or an allotment, if you will, is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Now uh, here, this tabernacle for the sun, if you have a companion Bible, make a side study of Bullinger's notes, but here's where we're talking about the house for the sun or of the sun, and we get into the zodiac. The signs of the zodiac are called houses of the sun. Uh, in them, in, in the, the zodiac, our Heavenly Father moves throughout a circuit throughout the universe, just as we uh, move through His Word in a circuit, and, and we gain knowledge and wisdom from His Word. Now, and again, I'm not, don't make a religion out of this. You know, all too often the heathen have made religion out of the sun or the moon or the stars. Don't get off in boom boom land. We don't make a religion out of these lights that God put in. He's our heavenly father. He's the one that placed the, the stars and the moon there. We don't worship uh, stars and, and moons and suns. But if this subject interests you, uh, we do offer a book in our library. It's by Bullinger, the gentleman who did the scholarly notes on the companion Bible called Witness of the stars. But again, don't make a religion out of it. But 
uh, this is given to us as a comparison and, and, and this I hope will come together for you a little more as we get down into his word. Let's go further. Verse 5, which is, or and again referring to the, the son is what we're going to be talking about here, or he as a bridegroom cometh out of his chamber, out of the uh, bridal canopy, and rejoiceth, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race, just as a, a young uh, bridegroom is, is full of uh, vigor as he begins his new life uh, with his bride, a new beginning, if you will. The sun is the same way when he comes up in the morning. Verse 6, his going forth, referring to the sun, is from the end of the heaven. The sun rises in the east every morning and his circuit unto the ends of it. The sun goes down in the west at dusk and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. In other words, you can't hide from the sun. Thank goodness uh, uh, we depend on the sun to uh, grow plants in which we take nourishment uh, as uh, flesh depends on the sun, the heat thereof, of course, and the light that it gives. Now, uh, I, I can't help but believe that there's a lot more to all of this than we're ever going to understand in the flesh. And uh, I refer to in Ezekiel chapter 1, the book of Revelation also, we're, we're talking about the throne of God when it's moving. You remember you have those four faces of the angels there, the, the face of a man. Uh, you have the ox, the eagle, and also the lion. And if you're familiar in, in the book of Numbers, the place of encampment for Israel, you had the tabernacle where God was in, in his throne on the Ark of the Covenant, surrounded by Israel, the tribes of Israel. And on one side of it, you had the standards, the sign, the flag, if you will, that represented Judah on one side, which was, of course, the lion. Uh, you have Ephraim on one side, the ox. You have the eagle of Dan on the other, and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, the man, which is Reuben. So the four major tribes formed a protective circle around the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, they and two other tribes were on the north, east, south, and west of the tabernacle. And the same thing, when, when, when I think this is interesting, the same thing when you have the throne of God moving in the book of Ezekiel and also in the book of Romans, you have these same four faces, the eagle, the ox, the man, and of course the lion of Judah. Um, and again, I'm not trying to make a religion out of this. I'm just saying there's a whole lot more to it than what I think we are going to know in the flesh. Now we go to the, the word of God, the parallel, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's spotless. It's, it's well-meaning. Converting the soul uh, the testimony of the Lord is sure, it's certain, making wise the simple. I like this verse. The, the converting is uh, returning or restoring to quicken, to make alive. Uh, just like we talked about the prodigal son early on in this, the lecture, that if you're away from your father and then you come home, it makes his day and he welcomes you. And when you convert, in other words, when you uh, return or restore to him, it's the same with your heavenly Father. I really want you to check out this word simple in your Strong's Concordance. It's pethi in the Hebrew language. And you know what it means? It means seducible. Uh, just like the word is utilized in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, where Paul says, you know, I, I'm fearful that you're going to be just as the serpent who was crafty and subtle, uh, he beguiled Eve in the Garden of Eden. That word in the Greek, expatio, it means he wholly seduced 
Mother Eve. So uh, those who are seducible, you need to get into God's Word. It will make you wise to where the serpent can't seduce you as he seduced Mother Eve. Verse 8, the statutes or precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the enlightened eye is a sign of, of not only good physical health, but good mental health and good spiritual health as well. I like this. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Have you ever had a bad day? You know, things just didn't go right all day long. And, and I like to sit down, particularly on those days, and, and pull the Word of God out. And sure enough, you know, an hour, uh, maybe more study, and you feel better. You, you, your heart is lifted. Your heart is lightened. The, the load that you were carrying is, is lightened from your shoulders as well because you've yoked yourself to Jesus Christ. He makes your load light. Verse 9. The fear, your, your awe in the Hebrew meaning reverence. It can mean fear, but here it means reverence. The reverence of the Lord is clean or uh, cleansing, especially in a Levitical or a priestly sense. Enduring forever, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Verse 10, more to be desired are they, the words of God, than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And I encourage you to build your treasures in heaven. You know, you can spend your whole life accumulating all of the physical gold that you possibly can. But you know what? When you die, your gold is going to stay right here on earth. And it's not going to be your gold anymore. It's going to be somebody else's gold. And you've wasted all those years accumulating that gold. Whereas if you built your treasures in heaven, and how do you do that? With the Word of God. That's what we're talking about here, beloved. Don't get carried away with physical possessions of the flesh. Get into your Father's Word. And, and it is sweet. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, we see there that the Lord came to earth. His throne came to earth. That's where I was talking about a minute ago with those four faces uh, protecting and surrounding him as he came to earth. But he told Ezekiel, you take this roll and you're, have your belly take it in. In other words, you eat this roll. And Ezekiel said, I did. I took the, the word. That roll was symbolic of God's word, the scroll, if you will. And he ate it. And he said in his mouth it was sweet as honey. And that word is so very, very sweet. I uh, started to go ahead and finish this psalm, but I don't want to rush the end of it. Uh, we'll have a short message. We'll come back in tomorrow and, and finish this psalm and, of course, get into the next. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico. 
the United States and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to phone in to possibly be answered on the air, you feel free to call that number and leave it. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. We simply won't do it. We, we teach God's Word. We'll let it do the uh, correcting, the, uh, and the teaching, the healing, and the correcting. And it does all three when you think about it. If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in as well. And always a pleasure to hear from you uh, who are around the world and, and how your particular uh, studies, your ministries are, are doing. And got a prayer request, we can do away with the number. You don't need a telephone, you don't need paper and pencil and a mailing address. You know, your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you're loving and serving Him, you know what? He wants to bless you. Uh, he wants you to find peace of mind in His Word. And again, He owns everything in the universe. And if you're pleasing Him, uh, He's going to bless you. And always remember that. Things not going so good in your life, you might do a little self-analysis. Do you love your Father? Are you serving Him? If you're not, you know, don't expect any blessings from Him. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to look upon these. You know their needs. Uh, we have illnesses, uh, problematic uh, marriages, Father, uh, addictions to alcohol and drugs. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing to each of these who are seeking your help, Father. Uh, we also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, protect, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. Uh, got first up today, uh, Peggy in Texas. You said God's son was born of Mary. And if God was born of Mary and Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And you know, I see your confusion here. You, you don't understand the Trinity. And, and Jesus was born of Mary. His Father, because he was the only begotten Son of our Heavenly Father, was Yahweh, okay? But you need to understand the Trinity. And, and, and also you need to understand, what did they say to call Jesus? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin will conceive and you'll call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? If you translate it rather than transliterate it, it means God with us. So his name also in the Hebrew, Yeshua, which is Yahweh's Savior. That was the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth in the flesh, as it's written in Hebrews chapter 2, what is it, verse 14, that, that, that he came to earth to defeat death. And he who has the power of death, that is to say, the devil. Uh, death, uh, where is thy sting, grave, where is thy victory? Uh, second question you follow in the Bible, it says, no one knows the hour, not the angels, not the sun. So did the sun come or did God come? And again, you're still confusing uh, the different offices of our Heavenly Father. You probably need to order uh, Pastor Arnold Murray's work called Nature of God. And that will give you a, a good bi hour Bible study on what the chapel teaches concerning the Trinity. Some on the internet would have you believe that we don't believe in the Trinity. Well, if you listen to this program very long, you're going to hear us talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if that's not the Trinity, I don't know what is. Ran, I don't know if that's an abbreviation for, well, anyway, that's what I got. Ran in Michigan. A lot of people say that the Lord does not speak anymore. What is your point of view? I know the Lord has spoken to me, and it says his sheep hear his voice and follow him. Just wondering what your point of view is on hearing uh, Christ. Well, God speaks to all of us through the letter that he wrote to us. It's called 
the Bible. And, you know, God, does God have the ability to speak with his children if he chooses to do so? Of course he does. But it's not an everyday thing. And I'd be real leery of someone who says, I talked to God this morning and he said this and that, so you should really listen to me. Uh, be really leery. You know, again, I'm not doubting that God has the uh, capability if he wishes to speak with one of his children, but there's a lot of one upmanship uh, in the religious community, and particularly in about who you should listen to because I have a direct link with the Heavenly Father. I do too. It's called His Word. And if you haven't taken time to study His Word, you're missing that direct link yourself. And I don't have a name or a state. We'll go with it though. Revelation 12, 7. When Satan and the angels fall during the war in heaven, did this take place before the catabole which helped cause the catabole to happen, or is this yet to come in the future? I thought it had already happened. You're mistaken. Uh, the catabole, which is a Greek word that uh, is the, it's translated in the New Testament, the foundations of the world, but it's referring to the time in the first earth age, the first heaven age, when Satan rebelled against God. And one-third of the angels, as it's written in, in, what is it, Revelation chapter 12, uh, followed Satan. And uh, that was the catabole. Now, what you're reading in Revelation 12, 7 is yet future. Uh, Michael and his angels war with Satan and his angels. Michael is victorious and boots Satan out of heaven. But guess where he goes? He comes right here onto earth and he will appear here as the Antichrist. He wants you to think he is Christ. All he wants you to do is worship him. Many will be deceived. Many will worship him. Richard in California, you refer to the eighth day creation. What happened to the sixth day creation when sin came into the world? Did the sixth day creation live over 2,000 years without death. Well, you've got it. And, you know, there was no sin until commandments were given. And the first commandment in God's Word was given to the eighth day creation, Eth Ha'adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And that commandment was, of all the trees in the garden you can freely take, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you cannot partake of that list you do in that day, you will die. Uh, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. You know how long the oldest man after the eighth day, Adam, Eth Ha'adam was? Methuselah, 968 years old. He almost made it to the 1,000 years, but he didn't. Uh, so, and Methuselah lived 968 years. Uh, for some of the sixth day to live 2,000 years without dying, that's not all that big of a stretch. Tom in North Carolina, please verify Psalm 90 verse 10. The last three words, we fly away. Someone might try and use that to support the fly away doctrine. And you're right, many have, but that's not the subject there. The subject in Psalm 90 isn't rapture, the subject is uh, we live to be 70 years old, that defines one of our generations, length of years, 70, or if we're lucky, 80 years old, uh, then we fly away. It's talking about when we die, uh, the flesh, of course, as it's written in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, goes back to the earth from which it came. The Spirit returns to our Heavenly Father from which it came. Pam in Arkansas, if one of your family members makes a mistake and had to go to prison, would it be wrong to send that person a little money for things uh, he, I'll say, or she may need? I don't know how God would feel about this. I know that person is in prison for punishment but I also know that family needs to keep in touch. 
by ways of encouragement to stay focused on the Lord. And uh, Pam, there's nothing wrong with helping a family member who messed up and is now incarcerated. It's, it's, a, it's a punishing hard life, no doubt. And for you to be able to, it's, it's the compassionate uh, thing for you to do, to, to reach out to that one and try and help them. And just the smallest things, uh, I would imagine, can be uh, quite a comfort. Many times, uh, people who study with the chapel uh, ask us to send uh, study materials to a friend or a family member uh, who is incarcerated. And not any problem doing that. We do ask if you do that, though, please be sure and check with the institution uh, where your friend or family loved one is incarcerated uh, to determine what they are allowed to have. They have pretty strict rules on what you can send into uh, the, the institutions, and for good reason. Uh, to, for example, sometimes hardback books are not allowed into prison. Why? Because uh, someone would take the hard cover and make what they call a shank, which is a handmade knife, and then use it uh, to harm a guard or another prisoner. So uh, a reason for everything, but always check and see what your loved one is allowed to have before you ask us to send, please. Larry in Utah, God completely cured me of a 35-year battle with alcohol then led me to your television ministry. My question is, could one of God's elect have been born with such an ailment? You and your son are great teachers. Thank you for that. We, we love the Word. We love teaching it. Plus, your staff is fantastic, and thanks for remembering our staff. We have a very hard-working group of people who helps get the Word of God out uh, through their efforts. And yes, I believe God uh, could put uh, one of his elect in someone who uh, had an addiction to alcohol or drugs. You see, God is looking for overcomers, and you already have overcome a tremendous uh, problem, and that, of course, being alcoholism. That is a disease, no doubt about it. So you've already overcome a lot. And besides that, uh, Larry, when you think about it, it's not what we do here in this, the second earth age in our flesh bodies that gets us into the position of being one of God's elect. It's what you did in the first earth and heaven age. That is uh, what separates the elect from the non-elect. Gary from Florida. My brother got rebaptized for his new place of worship. I told him it was like a kick in the face to our Lord, did I do wrong? He said, show me in the Bible where you're not supposed to be baptized twice. Help me or tell me I was wrong. I am a jarhead. I can take it. Ha ha. And jarhead, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar, of course, is a marine. Now, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, Gary, uh, verses 4 and 6 uh, talk about when we come to knowledge. In other words, when we're saved and we first start understanding God's Word. But then if we fall short, which we all do, we all sin. But when we sin, it talks about in verse 6 that we shouldn't re-crucify, <clears throat> excuse me, we shouldn't re-crucify Christ, but that we should repent, and that's what we do. Rather than, uh, it wasn't Jesus who failed uh, on the cross, it was we who failed. We were saved and then we fell short, we messed up. So then in that case we repent. Uh, we don't go and be re-saved or re-baptized. And, and you know, some churches insist that you be baptized by their church or they won't allow you to join their church. So. Yeah, you have to kind of uh, decide, do you want to join that church or not? Uh, I particularly, if they weren't willing to uh, accept, if, if I know my baptism was of uh, the Lord, Jesus Christ, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they weren't uh, willing to accept that as a baptism, 
I believe I'd kick the feet off on my feet and go somewhere else. But uh, if you want to join that church, you're probably going to have to follow their rules. Donald and Anna in Iowa. Are we in the generation of the fig tree? Where can we find this in the Bible? Well, if you understand the parable of the fig tree, you know that we are in that generation. That shoot was set out in the year of our Lord, 1948, uh, when Israel once again became a nation. Now the question is, is it a 40-year, 70, or 120-year generation? And of course, 40 is already uh, long past. So uh, you need to order Pastor Arnold Murray's work entitled uh, Parable of the Fig Tree. It's critical. Uh, Jesus himself said, not maybe get around to learning the parable of the fig tree. He said, now learn the parable of the fig tree. So uh, you need to learn it as well. Deborah in Arkansas, should I be giving a tithe if I don't even have enough money to pay my bills? And the answer to that is no. Uh, Christians pay their bills. We, we buy our groceries. We purchase our medicines that we need. And if you don't have enough after you've paid your bills and, and put food on the table and the medicines you need and still have enough left to tithe 10%, you don't have it to give. So no, you don't. But you know, if you're able to make a love offering, uh, God honors that as well. But I encourage you to work to get out of that situation. And I know sometimes it takes time. Uh, you know, those credit card bills at 25%, they didn't get there overnight. They're not going to go away overnight. But take a positive step. Uh, there are a lot of good uh, Christian-based nonprofit organizations that will help you get your financial life in order. And uh, again, I encourage you to take steps to correct that situation. No, nobody should be in a situation if you're aware of God's Word and you follow His rules and stay away from that usury of 25-30 percent, uh, you shouldn't have to live that way, check to check. So uh, consider it. Judy in Georgia. I have studied with Pastor Arnold and Pastor Dennis for a long time. Thank you for your teachings. I have learned so much and we're glad you enjoy studying. Many times I have heard Pastor Arnold say, Semper Fi, but I don't know what this means. Well, we just had a letter from a jarhead a few minutes ago. Uh, that again is a Marine. And Pastor Arnold Murray is a Marine. I started to say he was a Marine, but you never was a Marine. You are a Marine or you aren't. And he is a Marine. And Semper Fi is an abbreviation for uh, a Latin phrase, Semper Fidelis. And the Marines, when you hear Pastor Murray say Semper Fi, it's to a Marine, such as that jarhead we had just a minute ago. You can bet Pastor Murray would have said Semper Fi to him. But Semper Fi is a oath or a motto that Marines have, and it means, if you translate it, always faithful. In other words, Marines are always faithful to other Marines, and that's what Semper Fi means. David in Tennessee, where is it in the Bible that Satan's days were shortened from seven years to three and a half years to five months? And you'll find that in Revelation uh, chapter 9, uh, the five months, because that's the season of the locust. May through September, you have that five-month period. And of course, uh, Christ is the one who said, uh, I've shortened the time of that the Antichrist, Satan, will be here on earth for the elect's sake. Jackie and I don't know where Jackie's from. My name is Jackie, here we go, in Missouri. I apologize for the writing. Let me get into your question. Thank you for your time and patience. My question is, what does our Savior Jesus Christ mean when he says in Matthew 23, verse 9, and call no man your father upon the earth? For one is your father which is in heaven. Is it wrong to call your parent 
father. And of course, it's not wrong to call your flesh father, uh, father. And Jesus means don't compare anything or anyone on earth to your heavenly father. That's what the teaching there and often uh, misunderstood. Cameron from Georgia. Thank you for your welcome. I believe you mentioned that we are in the fifth trump, uh, the time of teaching. Many other end time teachers explaining Revelation state that we are in the sixth uh, trump due to Israel's statehood since 1948. Could you please explain? It concerns me that there may be a lot of empty seats at the dinner feast with our groom. I pray the world repents and comes to know his love for us and the price Jesus paid was so great. And there certainly will be a lot of fee uh, empty seats at the wedding feast if you believe we are currently in the sixth trump. Because when that one appears on earth claiming to be Christ, you're going to think, huh, let's see, we were in the sixth trump and Jesus is here. We're now in the seventh trump. This is Jesus. And they're not going to be fit to be the bride of Christ when he returns, when the seventh trump does finally get here. Out of time. Love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's word in depth. And you know what? It makes his day when he looks down and he sees you seeking knowledge of him through the letter he wrote to you, the word, the Bible that he wrote to you. Uh, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we've helped you, uh, and only if we've helped you. Help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, beloved, you stay in his word. You know, every day in our Father's word is a good day, and I mean even when we've got troubles. Do you know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel. Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.